Welcome to the South Bay Midweek Prayer and Bible Study. I know you're going to enjoy today's presentation. The live session is even better because we pray together at the beginning. Feel free to join us Tuesdays at 6.30 p.m. You can find the link on our website. Now sit back and enjoy some spiritual refreshment. For the past couple of weeks, we've been hearing from uh, uh, experiences in Germany and then experiences in Korea. And now we're here about experiences in Russia where Dr. Boz was um, called to go there as a medical missionary, he and his wife. And he faced many unexpected challenges. And of course, we are sin abound, grace much more abounds. And so there were blessings as well. Um, Dr. Bowes is married to Michaelin. You'll hear him refer to her as a Mickey. Uh, they have two grown children and he's a member here of South Bay Seventh-day Adventist Church. Since 2019, he currently works at the Siskin Hospital for physical rehabilitation there in Chattanooga, where he is the medical director. And um, we'll be listening to him again tonight as he share some experience as uh, the situation there intensify. I think this week we are gonna get more of the more intensified portions of the testimony. So over to you now, Dr. Bowers. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, Welcome. You recall last week we uh, left off with a story, really a Russian allegory that was told to me by my, one of my Russian translators. And he told me that this allegory would help me to better understand the Russian psyche. Um, and the story goes that a peasant Russian farmer we'll call him Alexei, was given uh, one wish by the angel Gabriel. He could wish for whatever he wanted, another cow, a new barn, a better plow, uh, and he, it would be honored. So he was thrilled. And as the angel was preparing to leave for the evening, he told him, Alexei, there is one other thing you need to know, that whatever I grant to you will be granted double to your neighbor, Sergei. And so Gabriel the angel departed, and uh, Alexei, as you can imagine, did not sleep. He was up all night tossing and turning and thinking about what it is that he should ask for. Oh, that would be good, but oh, Sergei will get double of that. And so he, he, he contemplated this question all night. The next morning, the angel Gabriel reappears. He says, uh, Alexei, I, I am ready. I'm glad to tell you that we are going to uh, that God is going to honor your request. What is it that you wish for God to do for you? And Alexei said, "Well, my request is that you put out one of my eyes. I've never really understood that. But you know the consequences for his neighbor. That's I think not only the Russian psyche, but that's human nature, that we often are like those crabs in a barrel, you know, you hear about one tries to get a little higher and crawl out and the others will pull him back down. And um, we often see that. The year that Adventist Health Center started and opened in 1992, um, things were very different than they are now. So I don't want you to assume it's like that now. Um, my wife and I have been there recently, not during COVID time, but it's, it's transformed. It's very, very uh, different. Um, it's much more European Western is what uh, Russians would say, but not to give the West credit really. Um, and truly they've accomplished a lot in these years. But the year that we opened the clinic in 1992, 80% of joint ventures failed. The Adventist Health Center was one of those successful few. And success is determined simply by, did you open and operate? Not, did you operate for at least a year or five years? Did you make a profit? None of those things are determined in success of these numbers that were given at that time. Just did you open? And did you operate? Well, last week we told a lot about how the Lord had blessed at the Adventist Health Center and really in a larger scale, the entire Adventist work across Russia. 
and how the Lord had prepared our small little denomination for a long time to be able to uh, in, uh, be present in Russia in every aspect, from education to seminary to pastors. Uh, at one time, I didn't mention last week, but Peter Kulik, he was of Russian descent, and he was from Australia and the construction uh, man, and he and his family came over, and at one time, he was in charge of construction of over 300 churches in the Euro-Asia division region. Um, and um, so churches were being built, uh, but not as fast as the evangelistic meetings were bringing new uh, converts in. Success breeds envy and greed wherever you are. And we had challenges in this regard, both from inside and from outside. From inside, most notable was our required joint venture partner. And from out without was the Russian mafia. So we'll talk about within first. At the time in 1991, when we first were there, as the Soviet Union had collapsed, Russia was developing new laws and regulations. And one requirement was that all foreign entities or businesses, clinics, et cetera, must have an assigned Russian partner. That means the government decided who that was. You, American General Conference, did not have any say. These arrangements were all made really unbeknownst to me and prior to our arrival. But when we arrived, we discovered our assigned joint venture partner, a big kind of a beefy, strong, masculine kind of guy, uh, met us with a big smile at the airport. His name was Victor, and he had flowers for my wife. Any special occasion, Russians are very faithful with bringing flowers. We Americans could learn a lot from that. Russian, um, v Victor was a savvy Russian businessman at the time. He had been a prior diplomat who'd been stationed for several years in Cuba. So he spoke Spanish, but not English. He was not an Adventist, not even a professing Christian. But some of our Adventist leaders were acquainted with him and they seemed to have a mutual respect for one another. His wife was a dentist. She had a leadership role in one of the local Moscow city dental clinics. Well, since I was the president and CEO of the Adventist Health Center and he was the Russian partner, his expectation was that the two of us and our families would live the high life above the level of all the workers. For example, when Victor found out that our daughter liked horses, he immediately arranged and set up horseback riding lessons for her at an elite equestrian center in Moscow. This is the place that they trained Olympic equestrian riders. Um, we didn't last very long there. One lesson cost more than a monthly salary. Uh, he, had an, he had a new Volga. That's the top of the line Russian made automobile lined up for us at the Adventist Health Center to purchase. And of course, a chauffeur ready to hire. He was also planning on building a dacha. Uh, dacha is kind of the name for a country home. So he was gonna build a dacha from the building materials that were being used to rebuild the Adventist Health Center. Evenings were for dining out at extravagant, gorgeous, uh, old 1800s buildings that were now restaurants, and then going to the Bolshoi Theater for ballet or opera. Or if they weren't operating or we had seen it, we were to go out to an exquisite nightclub for drinking and dancing with government officials and society. I don't know how that fits with all you guys, but for Mickey and I, it didn't take long to figure, figure it out. We had different worldviews. We had different goals, aspirations, lifestyles, and operational approaches. It wasn't all so long before the general conference realized that being yoked with this unbeliever was not going to work. And the government changed the rules about that time, allowing the general conference to partner with the local Seventh-day Adventist mission or later became the Euro-Asia division. 
So the general conference set about to change the arrangement and remove Victor from the joint venture. However, joining up with the Adventist Health Center and the general conference were Victor's ticket to a good and profitable rest of his life. And he was not going to let go of this life plan without a fight. But God needed to purify the inside of the Adventist Health Center before we could withstand the attacks from the outside. The external controls of communism in the, in the country at that time were being replaced by Western materialism, greed, and crime. Now, the Westerners always got the responsibility or the, the credit, you might say, for materialism. But I think materialism is in the heart of every unsanctified human. And it uh, was present there. It, I thought of it often as the wild, wild west. The strong defeats the weak. There was no consistent rule of law. The government itself could not agree on what was law. We moved to Moscow February 2, 1992. Chuck and Charlotte had moved there three weeks before to oversee the construction of the Adventist Health Center rising from the ashes of a deserted kindergarten. Chuck was to be our dental lab technician, an excellent technician, but he also had the um, blessing of being a, a contractor, so he understood construction. He was the man for the time. So they had started about three weeks ahead of us. Um, by the time we had gotten far enough and we were ready to install the dental chairs and take them out of storage, um, we had a dilemma. Things were so bad and uncertain that we weren't sure whether or not when we actually put the dental chairs in and the equipment, whether the whole building and enterprise would be stolen from us by Victor and the now supportive Moscow City Health Department. When I say supportive, I mean supportive of Victor. For example, the Adventist Health Center had written an agreement to purchase the building that we paid to renovate. But during the time we were rebuilding the clinic, the government officials had changed. The new officials told me they hadn't agreed for any such thing that we would be able to buy the building. That was someone else. They had to make their own determination. After uh, prayer and consultation with the general conference, we did install the dental chairs, all the equipment and furniture. Actually 11 months after renovation started, November, 1992, the Adventist Health Center was open for patient care. By the way, the Moscow City Health Department and government never did sell the clinic building and land to the Adventist Health Center or the EuroAsia division, but it did allow us to rent the building every year, year by year, renegotiating the rates and the favors they felt we owed them. During construction process, it became clear we needed to gain control of the clinic from Victor, who ruled with an iron hand. It was also self-serving and dishonest. He regularly lied, spread false rumors about us in the Adventist church, in the community, to the government officials, in the media and newspapers. He broke signed legal documents. I was fascinated. He would cut our telephone lines on repeated occasions. One day, he, he had a, a small mob of strong looking men, young. He invaded uh, the clinic, you might say, with his trained guards and took all the keys from the clinic away from us. That was when I decided he, I had to move in. Uh, the plan was ultimately we and the dentist would be housed on the second floor of the clinic. Eventually that happened, but it wasn't finished. We didn't have any, <laughs> anything in. There was a toilet in the building, um, but we had nothing for, to, move it, uh, to live with. But we got our sleeping bags and that day moved in the clinic. After that, we never had, we never went out of the building without having my family member or fellow workers on the inside of the building so that we could get back in 
because Victor had already tried locking us out before. Eventually, I was able to hire good Christian Adventist guards and in one quick move, replace the locks and Victor's guards with ones that were now loyal to us. One weekday after the Adventist Health Center was operational, I looked out the clinic window and I saw this big crane, not just big, huge. Our gates were big. Our lock, I've never seen a bigger lock than was on our clinic gates to get into the uh, grounds. This crane dwarfed all of that. It was monstrous. It had rolled up to the side gate of the clinic and was lifting it off the hinges. I, I didn't know what was going on. I went out there and I was met with Victor and a, oh, 15 hired thugs that he had surrounding him and the crane. Well, the clinic people, I, we got the clinic folks to all come out, hold hands, you know, so they could not uh, come into the property. But that crane did not look like it was stopping. Moving very slow, but it got up to where it was touching us. And there wasn't always the sense that they had a lot of respect for people's lives. Um, yes, many stories. Uh, for example, if you got hit on the road when, uh, by a driver, okay, you're a pedestrian, you're hit on the road. The car will quickly pull over. I saw this happen at least four times. Um, car will pull over and you think, what are they gonna do? Check to see if you're hurt. So the person, first time I saw this, I was very shocked. The person is getting up and they're limping away. They're not just limping, they're limping and running away. The guy jumps out of his car, runs over to the pedestrian who he had just hit and starts beating him up. He was knocking him, knocked him down to the ground and kicking him and finally left him alone. But he had the audacity to get in front of his car. I wasn't real confident that the crane wouldn't run us over too. So I called our people off and said, let's, you know, we're not gonna sacrifice our lives under this crane. I'm not gonna have you get hurt. In the end, they quickly that day constructed a concrete wall. You know how they can bring in big pieces of concrete and set them down. And they constructed a concrete wall separating one third of the property from the remaining Adventist Health Center property. I called the police, they came there that day. Yeah, but they said, oh, this is an internal matter. We showed them all our documents, didn't matter. They said, it's an internal matter, y'all sort it out. The health department, I went to them the next day. They, they were very dramatic. They said, oh, Victor will leave by the same gate he came in, but he didn't. Have you ever noticed that Satan uses our faithfulness against us? What landed Daniel in the lion's den? His faithful prayer life. Our faithful attendance to Sabbath school and church ended up to be the time when Victor chose to steal the next third of our property. By now, he didn't need a crane uh, to lift off the gates. He had his own, but he got another crane and extended uh, the, the line of concrete wall by another third. He had succeeded in stealing the first third, but he had gotten a lot of bad press, and he wanted to do this when we were not present to mount a defense, you might say. He ultimately built a building four times the size of the Adventist Health Center within 10 yards of our building on the back side. We contract, contacted all government agencies imaginable with volumes of legal paperwork, including documents Victor had recently signed with the EuroAsia Division and the General Conference, but to no avail. We had done everything right, moral, legal, honest, and lost. I wasn't used to that. I was the General Conference missionary. And you know what? I hated Victor. I had never hated anyone else in my life. I actually desired bad things to happen. In Psalms 5, four through six, God talks about how he hates the workers of iniquity and that he will do, uh, he will hold them to account and do bad things to them. 
I had advice for God. I had picked out several times when I thought, God, now's a good time. Make good on your promise. Do it to Victor. He had been blatantly dishonest, and his illegal efforts were crowned with victory. I thought my hatred was certainly justified. Matter of fact, I thought it was probably righteous wrath in godly hatred. I learned that two good things came out of this experience. One is God taught me and gave me the power to forgive Victor. Though Victor never asked for forgiveness, he was proud of his actions and he was still seeking to destroy us and God's work without remorse. But you see, my forgiving of Victor was essential for my salvation. And it was essential for the Adventist Health Center to be able to move forward in God's work. The other good thing that came from it was that Victor left in time with the property he stole. He focused on the new joint venture and construction of his new building. Eventually, he left us alone. Although two thirds of our property had been stolen, we still had what we needed to function and fulfill our mission. We were free of Victor, but not without paying the price of being unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Uh, one example of God's deliverance during this time, Victor went to a reporter for the main Moscow newspaper. And, she, and he had her write, from his point of view, a terrible article incriminating the Adventist Health Center and particularly the director from the United States, accusing this director, me, I suppose, and the Adventist Health Center of stealing the kindergarten from underneath their children and mistreating the poor Russian people engaging in illegal activity and refusing to pay appropriate taxes. I was concerned that this would turn all Russian officials, including the Adventist church members and local people against us, perhaps even resulting in closing us down and evicting us foreigners from the country, if not imprisoning me. As expected, this article well publicized, resulted in a government investigation of me and the Adventist Health Center. After some weeks had passed, much interrogation and examination of records, etc., when all was said and done, the Moscow newspaper wrote a rebuttal of their previous article and a scathing article of Victor and extremely supportive of the Adventist Health Center and the Seventh-day Adventist humanitarian work that was being done through the clinic. This resulted in an interview regarding our work at the Adventist Health Center on the largest radio station in Russia. Only God knew how to work that out. In Russia, much of the time, I didn't know the rules. I didn't understand the culture. Let me illustrate a banana. All of you have seen and eat probably bananas. I have looked through the, uh, the, what do you want to call it? Anyway, all of the folks here, some of you I can see and a lot of you don't have it on the, on the video. Um, so you can't really raise your hands and get a full, full uh, group uh, count. But I will ask the question, how do you peel your banana? Do you, let me ask you, do you peel it from the stem end? I see nods, yes. Okay, I see pretty much most people that are on nodding yes. Any of you peel it from the flower or the other end? No, Peter, not even you. Okay, nobody else. Yeah. Sam does. I do. Who does? I do too. I do. I do. I do too. 
Okay. There are some other countries that peel it from this end, particular Eastern Europeans and goes along with Russia. And then some of the Caribbean uh, countries I've noticed uh, as I've talked, but generally it's somewhat culturally. If you find a country, usually they appeal it. Americans generally who are native born US citizens peel it from this end. Why? It's a cultural thing. Americans will tell you why they do it. Oh, they can grab it, get a better grip, et cetera. It's easier actually to peel from this end. And you know what? Those who peel more bananas than anyone else, I better monkeys. And they peel it from the same end as the Russians. I think it's actually easier and better. But why we do the things we do are often more cultural than they are cognitive. After living three years in Moscow and traveling all over the prior Soviet Union and beginning to learn the language, there was one thing I knew. And that was that the mafia runs the business world there, particularly in Moscow, where we lived. Between the Adventist Health Center and the Metro, which we all use for our, as our primary form of transportation, was about 300 yards. So Adventist Health Center, 300 yards to the Metro. It was a short walk and there were several kiosks. Now kiosks were small, perhaps six foot deep by 10 foot wide stands. And there would be one person in here and they would sell out of this kiosk various items and different kiosks specialized in different items, but they had a wide variety of things. One day I noticed one of them was burned out as I was walking home from or to the clinic from the Metro. I naively asked someone at the clinic when I arrived, well, that kiosk was here yesterday. Why is it burned out today? What happened? Did they get a short? So that's what I thought, because a lot of them had electricity. And they said, no, they said uh, they wouldn't pay the mafia. A bit later, another kiosk was burned out. Yes, it was the mafia. The banks were even terrorized by the mafia. A hundred of the bank presidents in Russia had formed what they called the round table. And part of their platform of these, of these uh, bank leaders, and these were bank leaders from Citibank uh, and various Russian banks and uh, German banks, uh, Swiss banks, et cetera. So these were um, international banks. They formed the round table and part of their platform to fight against the mafia. They had the best equipment and the best, most well-trained bodyguards that money could buy to protect them and to fight against the mafia. Yet in less than two years, 34 of 100 bank presidents were dead. They were killed by car bombs, drive-by machine gun shootings, rocket fired grenades into their apartments, their country homes or dodges blown up and burned with burned entire families inside. I can tell you, I was glad the mafia didn't bother us. We were a small not-for-profit clinic. We had only three departments, dentistry, physical therapy, and health education. We only had four dental chairs. It was an odd combination, you might think, but it was what the Moscow City Health Department had requested, so the General Conference provided these three areas. The mafia was one of the reasons we kept a low profile you know, you never saw any big flashy signs in front of our building, no advertising on radio or papers um, for the Adventist Health Center. But then we did have a six month waiting list for patients. Nick, you'll be next. This really was the result of the Lord having set up the Adventist Health Center in us operating at least a year and a half before any other Western style dental clinic in the entire previous USSR. Mick has a story to tell us about one of her experiences traveling on a flight out of Moscow. I was traveling by myself on Delta and this was, this was um, when things were pretty wild there. 
but we didn't have syringes. So David asked me to go buy some. You couldn't buy them in the USSR or needles anyway. Uh, so I was on the plane and as I got on, everything was absolutely silent. It was Delta and usually there's people at least chattering, but it was almost all men. I didn't see another woman besides myself. And I sat down between two Caucasian men and they were all totally silent, serious. Nobody said a word. They didn't even greet me. And I just felt this, well, you better not speak. So uh, it, was, it was just quiet, silent. And then Delta took off. And the minute the wheels left the ground and the plane hadn't blown up, everything exploded. The men threw up their hats, their gloves, whatever they had, briefcases. They just threw them up in the air. Some even unbelted the seat belts and the stewardess didn't stop it. And they just said, we are alive. We are going home. We get to go home alive. And um, then everybody was talking. It was total, complete talking. There wasn't stopping anybody. And the two men on either side of me said, what in the world are you doing here? And I said, well, have you ever heard of the Adventist Health Center? And they said, is that a dental clinic? And I said, yes. And he says, well, how do you know about that? And I says, well, my husband runs it. And he says, oh, the first question he asked, do you reuse needles like all the other dental clinics? And I says, no, that's part of the reason I'm flying out right now is we need more needles. And he said, well, let me get, both of them grabbed their briefcase to check um, if they had the right number, if they had the right connection, because they, if they couldn't get in with our clinic, they would have to fly to Germany, England, or the US if they have any dental emergency. And so they were, they were pretty excited to, you know, I was kind of amazed that they all seemed to know about us, but they were coming in to do business and they were, and they knew it was dangerous because once they had made money for the Russians, their partners would just knock them off periodically like the bankers. So they were all rather nervous, but um, yeah, it was kind of an exciting time. Thank you, dear. <clears throat> well, the mafia first hit the publishing house and seminary. It was located in Zaoksky, about 80 miles south of Moscow, a little town. Um, in the winter, actually, you could, it was cute because you could see the horses pulling the sleighs in the streets um, in Zaoksky. You wouldn't think the mafia would be there, but the mafia was everywhere. I became more concerned about the mafia as I knew they had approached the seminary asking for money. Uh, our prayers became more earnest. Lord, keep you know, Roy and Zeleny safe. At the seminary, the, ma the mafia approached them on a Wednesday. They asked for $3,000 cash by Friday. Uh, and it was protect, considered protection money. And um, we all knew of stories that people had you know, been hurt, damaged, killed uh, if they didn't pay the mafia. Well, on Thursday, the same mafia man who approached the seminary approached a businessman also in Zoksky who was from Tajikistan. This man from Tajikistan had a nice business going there in, in uh, Zoksky. And the mafia threatened him for protection money. After some discussion between the two men, the businessman agreed to pay the mafia's demands. And he excused himself to go into the bedroom to get the money. The mafia man said, fine. So he went into the bedroom and returned with his sword. He ran through the mafia man and killed him in his living room. On Friday, instead of extorting money from the seminary, the mafia man was buried. That brought me considerable amount of satisfaction and comfort, seeing how I wondered, I thought, that the Lord had protected the seminary in a way that seemed to befit the times that we were living in. 
But I learned that there was a big difference between the Adventist Health Center and the seminary and all the other church facilities. You see, the Adventist Health Center was a business and it charged money for services. In America, we're accustomed to charging sick people to receive care. In Russia, that, that went against the grain of their mindset and their culture. And by Russian definition, if you were nonprofit, you didn't charge money. You had a sponsor. So as the director of the Moscow and City Health Department had pointed out to me, since we charge our sick patients, we are not nonprofit. We are for profit, just like the banks, she told me just like the banks, but we have to pay our staff, our rent, utilities, buy expensive foreign dental equipment and supplies. The church couldn't afford to pay for that. And we treated 20% of our patients for free, discounted by 75%. The rest of our patients, except for 20%, only paid full price. And that allowed us to do everything else for free. A German uh, foundation, through us had distributed over $100,000 worth of IV antibiotics recently. And by now we had distributed 52 railroad cars full of hospital equipment and supplies, linens, et cetera, to the nine hospitals in Moscow, all through our little clinic. Um, one cool thing that uh, the US embassy had some, uh, came out again through Germany, some portable dental chairs and equipment. And it was very nice because once a month, we had four dental chairs, four dentists. So we would take two of our dentists out to a, uh, a drivable distance from Moscow and would operate a dental clinic in one of these small villages or communities where we had an Adventist church. And the Adventist church would announce it ahead of time as part of their evangelistic outreach that we would be able to come and provide free dental care to anyone who would come and also health education as well at the same time. Uh, and we were able to do this because of equipment that had been donated to us. But you see, none of that mattered. We were for profit. We were rich foreigners like the banks. On Monday, two men came to the clinic asking for the director of the clinic, Dr. David Bowers by name. They knew I was the director. One of them spoke English because they also knew I wasn't fluent in Russian. They told me the rules of doing business in Russia and how I and the clinic needed their protection. By this time, our family had actually moved in and lived in the second floor of the clinic and the dentist did as well. They promised that they would soon be back and contact me more about the details. After that, they would often regularly call me at my home phone number. How did they get my home phone? It wasn't listed. Now that we were under attack from the mafia, my prayers were even more earnest. I informed the general conference of what was happening. We tightened security at the Adventist Health Center, although we already had day and night watchmen, 24-7, uh, 365. We, had made, we made plans to move my family elsewhere if necessary, and we talked and prayed with the staff. Our windows at the clinic, it, it had been a kindergarten, so we had large windows. Even with curtains, it was easy to see when we were home, when we weren't, and you could see movement behind the curtains. It wasn't hard to tell when we were there. When uh, several of us went, had a habit of going out in the morning, and if you're any time other than middle of the summer, it's dark when you get up, you know, they have long summers, uh, long night, uh, long winters, nights. So in the darkness, we would go out jogging in the mornings and we would see these same fellas, these mafia guys sitting around the areas and observing us on our jog. They would watch us when we went to church each Sabbath. The mafia's calls and visits became increasingly threatening and the pressure built. 
never giving really me a, a chance to explain our position as a church serving those in need. They were demanding 15,000 US dollars a month or they would close us down. They also directly threatened the safety of our staff and my family. One day I got a call from a man who would not identify himself except to say that he was contacted by the general conference and they had told him to call me. He told me to come alone and ask for him as I got to a specific building. I went. I couldn't confirm whether this was actually a man from the general conference or not. See, our email and even our phone wasn't working that day. That's a problem that was regularly occurring. He didn't ask me for money, so my thought was he probably wasn't mafia. They always seem to want money. But he did call me on the same phone number that the mafia had used. Well, I took a trusted Russian man with me. He also could speak English, and he and I went to the door of the building. The greeter, you might say, who was dressed in camouflage without any symbol or insignia to designate which service of the military he was with, and with an AK-47, did not allow the Russian comrade to enter, only me. It was only the feeling that I had no choice that led me into that building. Upon entering the building, my gaze was instantly met by about 20 men similarly dressed in camouflaged military uniforms without an insignia and AK-47s or bigger slung over their shoulders. They were guards. I was immediately surrounded by three of these silent soldiers escorted to the elevator, taken up to the 16th floor, ushered down a long, dark, empty hall to a small room at the end. I was taken into the room and the door was locked behind me from the outside. I thought, well, here I am, 16 floors up in nowhere's land. No one knows exactly where I am locked in an unfriendly room with a man I've never seen before, surrounded by unmarked armed soldiers and threatened by the mafia. This was not what I had signed up for. I was supposed to run a clinic and see patients. As it turns out, this man was on our side and it was very knowledgeable about the mafia and he spoke fluent English. But he said there really wasn't much they could do to help me. I couldn't call him if I needed him because he didn't give me his phone number. He only gave me his first name. He did tell me one thing, definite positive instruction, never pay the mafia. You should consider leaving the country, he told me, but if you stay, never give in. Once you begin paying, you can never stop. Then he dismissed me, wished me luck, and I was escorted back down the elevator and out the front door. You remember after 9-11 in the US, the government formed a specific new department of the government called Homeland Security, right? Its sole purpose was to defend the homeland. Mafia was such a threat at this time, the Russian government formed an entire new section of the military to fight and defend themselves against the mafia. I went to the local priest, police, they offered no help. So then I went to this new branch of the military that President Yeltsin had formed to fight the mafia. I went to visit their headquarters. They were quite helpful. They gave me a small microphone that I could attach to my phone and record the telephone calls. And they informed me, however, that they could not get involved until the mafia had actually hurt or killed someone. That was, of course, very comforting. It didn't take me very long 
after all of this, a couple of weeks, to realize that we were clearly on our own. In my thinking, it was clear that we could not fight and win as a clinic against the mafia. Well, I knew God could fight and win for us, but would he choose to? I really wanted him to choose to make the Adventist Health Center the clinic against Goliath. But what if he didn't make that choice? He had to, didn't he? After all, we were missionaries for him. Our story hadn't been written yet. And I wanted to write it for God. I wanted control. Um, Kierkegaard, uh, the philosopher guy, he, he once said that you only understand life backwards, but you ha can only live life forwards. And I learned that, that we don't know what's going to happen and we don't know the future. That's where faith comes in. Unfortunately, I didn't think of it. But thankfully, a pastor at the division office, John McGee, did. He sent out a message by email to all of our Adventist workers around the world asking for prayer for the clinic. At the clinic, we began receiving messages by email. There was no um, all the media. The only thing we had was email. Um, from people from every part of the globe. We received emails from every continent on the earth except for the Antarctica. One day alone, we received 54 messages of how people were praying for us. They were quoting scripture and telling us they were, they were, um, were thinking and praying for us. I wondered, Oh, I was thankful for their prayers, but I wondered, are they sincere and earnest? Perhaps they have some hidden sin in their life so that God won't hear them. One quoted Psalm 27, 1 to 2. My wife's laughing, but I was serious. The, in Psalms, it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. This was a time of soul searching for me. I was not the only one vulnerable. My wife and two innocent children were with me. Our staff, about 60 at the clinic at that time, knew they were vulnerable because they were more expendable than Americans. Often in settings like this, the mafia would run over a Russian staff with their car. They would have them beat up or shot so as not to create an international incident. There would be no investigation into a Russian uh, occurrence like this, only if they were foreigners. We had served this country for three years, and even our church members still did not understand what we were doing there. In spite of our visiting all the local churches multiple times and talking with them about our work, the church members still thought that we should just treat Adventists for free and not treat non-Adventists. There's a reason for that. It goes deep in the cultural history of what had been happening for the last 70 years in uh, the Soviet Union. They didn't understand the concept of the health message being the opening wedge for the gospel and our work going hand in hand with evangelism. I wondered seriously, should we take the advice of that gentleman who the general conference had advised to call me and just slip out of the country and go home? Or should we stay for a battle we didn't start and we certainly were ill prepared for? Matter of fact, about that time, um, President Clinton had come to visit uh, Moscow. He stayed at a well-known uh, hotel that was the result of a joint venture between a well-known businessman and a group of Rus uh, Russian uh, citizens. It became publicized that this group of Russians was attempting to steal the clinic uh, from the American, the just hotel. Uh, the hotel, sorry, the hotel, and just have him leave with his life. He was not about to back down. He was not leaving. If anything, they had to buy him out 
give him a fair price, he would go. He was walking to the metro, not far from us, not our exact one, but three metro stops down uh, from his hotel one day, busy day, middle of the day, and he was machine gunned to death. His assassins were never discovered. Wednesday morning after this hit the newspapers, the mafia man called me a final time and told me that I must have $15,000 in cash on my person by Friday. They would find me. He said, you don't have to worry about finding us or how you're gonna pay us. Just go about your usual activities. We know where you are, we'll find you. Just have the money. That was Wednesday. My wife was touched by all the email prayer um, messages and words of encouragement that we were receiving. And she felt the staff would be encouraged also. So at lunch that Wednesday, just a couple hours after the mafia's final ultimatum, Mickey began taping the email messages one after another on the cafeteria wall. You see, we had a cafeteria for all of our employees. That was the custom in, of the time and place. And so all of our employees were there at lunch eating uh, a lunch. All the of our employees could not speak English. Actually, relatively few could. But those who couldn't got someone who could, and they began reading the messages. Tears flowed freely, and courage in the Lord grew. Friday came and went. The mafia did not appear. After that simple act of taping the email promises to the cafeteria wall, we never heard from the mafia again. I never saw them again. On my morning jogs, on uh, trips to Sabbath school and church, they were disappeared like a vapor in the night. I can only look forward to heaven to find out how the Lord delivered us. I realized, you know, at the beginning I said the one thing I knew about Russia was that the mafia controls the business world. I came to realize that one thing I knew was not true. God created this world and he is still in control. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us today. We hope you found today's presentation to be a blessing to you. And you know, it's never good to keep things to yourself. It's always best to share them. So find someone that you can share what you have been blessed with, with others. If you enjoyed today's presentation, let us know by hitting the like button and subscribe to this channel if you want to know when there's new presentations coming out. God bless. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.